Today I'm going to talk about chapter 9, but I'm also going to fill in a bunch of information that isn't necessarily in your book, so make sure that you're paying attention, taking good notes. If you took intro with me, you may have heard all of this before, so hopefully it's just a review. But I personally think that this is some of the most important stuff that you get as engineers, because who knows my, my quote or what I like to say about it. If you have the best idea in the world, but you can't communicate it to anyone, it's lost. So communication is one of the most important things that an engineer does. I'd like to start off the morning with a little joke. Your print job contains 562 spelling errors and is really boring. Do you want to print it anyway? Let's hope not. Who in here thinks that communication is an art? How about a science? How about both? In reality, there's a little bit of both that goes into our, te our communications, even our technical communications. So there's creativity that goes into it. It has to have a certain look, but it's also a science. There's content that has to be there. And even the formatting is very scientific, very prescriptive in how you should follow that. So by the end of today, you should understand how to format a memo because that's your first assignment. Uh, understand how to format a formal report, know how to produce good written reports, know how to properly include illustrations or figures in your text, understand proper mechanics in formal report writing, and understand how to deliver oral presentations. Let's start with writing. I really like this. It's in your book and all of the other books I've ever used. The kind of the golden rules they call them for our communications as engineers or technical writers is to keep it brief, keep it simple, and show it. So what is technical writing? It's all of the written communication that we do on the job. Why isn't that one? It could be uh, something like an email. It could be a memo, some sort of technical report that you're writing. It has some sort of practical purpose. An informed writer, or uh, you, someone who has knowledge that you're trying to convey to someone else. And then readers with diverse backgrounds and diverse needs. So we'll talk more about those readers here soon. There are nine steps that I'm going to go through in how to do this technical writing. And they go into these four categories. The first thing is, even though there's four here, there's nine steps within these. First thing you do is you have to know the reader. That's the most important thing, is understand your customer. Your reader is your customer. Then you need to know your information. Then you write it and you revise it. So first step under knowing the reader. Write a brief purpose statement. What it is, why are you writing it, what it is that you want from the reader, how do you want them to respond. And this is just for yourself so you understand exactly why you're doing this. You don't have to have a summary, conclusions, recommendations. Just write something out so that you understand your, your purpose. Then, understand the obstacles your reader is going to face. Know that they're going to be interrupted. They're going to be impatient. They may have different backgrounds. How many of you in here uh, have ever written me an email and I didn't respond right away? That's because I'm an interrupted, impatient reader. And so you have to think about your audience. I get about 100 emails just before I'm done with this class from 8 to 12. So I have to filter that. And so you, you might feel like I'm just uh, dissing you by not responding, but really I'm a very busy person. And this is going to be true when you are in industry and working. Your boss is probably going to be someone who gets lots of emails in a day. So how are you going to communicate with that person? It might be different than your friend who only gets five emails a day. The way that you communicate with people definitely depends on their background, how busy they are, and that kind of stuff. So things to ask yourself. What is their technical or educational background? Obviously, I'm an engineer, so you can use jargon with me or technical types of things. But at work, your manager might not be an engineer. So how are you going to communicate with that person? Or if you're trying to communicate to their manager, they're likely not going to have an engineering background. What main question does this person need answered? Did they ask something of you? So what is it that you're trying to address? 
What main action do you want them to take? Do you want them to follow up with an email to you? Do they need to write you a plan of study letter? Do they need to uh, do these types of things? Make sure that's extremely clear in your communication with them, whether it's an email, a memo, or a report. What features this, of this person's personality might affect his or her reading? Things to think about. What features does this person prefer, prefer in format, style, and organization? If you know that, you should tailor your formatting and style for that person. It's the best way to get the most effective response from them. Next, determine the technical levels of those readers. That's going to tell you how much stuff you need to put into your writing. Managers don't need a lot of detail. They want summaries, upper level stuff, actions, um, so not a lot of detail. Experts though, so maybe you're writing this to the FDA or some sort of tech group of technical experts, they want that detail. And they want the supporting information. So if you did an experiment, they want to see the data table about that experiment because they want all of those details. Operators. Many of you will work in manufacturing or in a factory setting and you'll have to work with operators. They want to know how to apply your ideas. They don't necessarily want all the details and the information behind them, but tell them how to apply it. And it needs to be clear. Don't dumb things down, but it needs to be clear. And then general readers, like your mom, maybe, doesn't need a ton of detail, but she wants a lot of clarity. And you might have to use some different vocabulary so she can fully understand. If you can explain what you're doing in your classes to your mom, if she's not an engineer, you're doing a really good job. <clears throat> then determine the decision-making levels of these readers. It's very important to understand your context. Is the person that you're writing this report for, this email for, going to make some sort of decision based on your information? Do they have the ability to make a decision? Not just do you want them to make a decision, but to, do they have the power within the company to actually make a decision? Or are they just an advisor? Are they then going to take your information and advise someone else to make a decision? It's different how you communicate with those different types of people. Or do they just receive information? And then five, find out what the decision makers want. Write down what you know about them. Talk to colleagues so you better understand these decision makers. And then the rule, kiss, keep it so short and simple, is always a good rule to follow. Maybe that's not the same words you used in that acronym, but that's the ones we'll use. All right, the next is to understand or know the information. A lot of people, especially in technical writing, might think that this is the thing that comes first, but really you should know your audience first or your readers. So to know your information, you want to collect your information uh, and document it very carefully. This is really, really critical, and I want to spend just a couple minutes on this. You might be collecting information by doing research on websites or in journals or on the patent website. That's something that you'll definitely be doing in here. We actually have someone coming in next week to talk about how to search for patents. It is critical that you cite your sources properly, okay? This means like if you are using direct words, exact words out of any of these sources, you use quotes and parentheses and inline citations and have a bibliography. If you're paraphrasing, which is what I recommend most often, you also have to have inline citations within the text and a bibliography. It's extremely important that you do this. If you don't understand how to do it, ask. We have people that can help you learn how to do this. For me, what I really like to do is this note card uh, technique. I have a stack of note cards and as I'm doing my research, gathering my information, maybe you just have a journal or something like that, I write it down here and then I'll categorize it. I'll say this is a direct quote, so that has, I put a quote right at the top of it. Or if it's a paraphrase, I write paraphrase right at the top of it. And then on the back, I write out the citation. So I have, I know exactly where I got that information. So then I have these stack of note cards and then I also then put some keywords at the bottom so I can categorize those and then I end up having them all over my floor and I'm like, oh, this paragraph gets this information and this paragraph gets this information and I like to move around and not just be at a computer to do this kind of stuff. But really, make sure that you understand where you got your information, record that regularly and have it very easy and clear. What else was I gonna say about that? <clears throat> oh, another uh, technique. When you read something, 
to ensure that you're not just going to, you think you're going to paraphrase it, but you actually end up writing the same thing down, read it, put it aside for a minute and do something else, and then go back and try to summarize it in your own words. If you take a step back and take a little bit of time away from it, it really helps you to be able to put it into your own words rather than just uh, copy what they said. Use the correct citation system. To be honest, I don't care which system you use, as long as you are using inline citations and you have a bibliography and you are consistent. So don't for half of the paper use APA and half the paper use MLA. Just be consistent, that's all I care. Then, after you've done all of these things and you've gathered all of your information, that's when you start to write. First thing is to start with an outline. This will really help you to uh, gather your thoughts, maybe start putting it all together. I really start with this kind of map thing where I write out the information or I put my note cards out and then I start drawing lines to each other and trying to connect the dots. Then put it into a nice outline. Then that outline can just become the headings for your, your paper. So those headings are like introduction and then materials and methods and so your outline and then you can have pieces under there to help you really organize your thoughts. Then you write your first draft and just write it quickly. I know this is one of the hardest things. You get, anyone ever get writer's block? Like you just sit at the computer staring at that little flashing cursor and you're like, oh, what do I write? What do I write? Well, just start writing. Don't worry about editing. Don't worry about complete sentences. Don't worry about your grammar, your English, any of that. Just start typing things. Then you can go back and fix it later. But really just getting started is the hardest part. So if you can just start writing, then it'll flow better. And actually something I've learned lately that helps me to be able to write is I got, I got a Chromebook and it has a stylus and uh, so I can write on the screen and it picks up my handwriting. So I'm actually writing by hand and it, then it turns it into type. I don't know if that might help anyone who gets writer's block a lot, but I find that transferring it from handwriting has really helped my thoughts come out a lot better than the typing. So just a couple techniques to help you with that writer's block in case you ever have that. All right, so start with your complete outline. Schedule blocks of time. It's really hard if you're like, oh, I'm in between classes, I'll try and write something real quick for five minutes. It doesn't really work that way. I would give yourself at least 30 minutes to an hour like scheduled on your calendar to try and start writing. Don't stop to edit. Worry about editing later. Just spew stuff out of your brain onto the screen or onto the paper. Begin with the easiest section. That would not be the executive summary. You can't start there. So start with what is easy to help get you going. And then write your summaries last. Then, after you have that first draft, then you can revise. Then you go back and worry about your sentences, your grammar, your English. You revise in stages. The first thing you want to do is adjust and reorganize your content. So does it flow right? Did you maybe need to put a little more background information before you get to this point? Think about it. Have someone else read it to see if it, they understand what's going on. Then you edit for style. Shorten your sentences. Make sure you don't have run-on sentences or you're trying to sound too smart with these really long sentences. Also change up your sentence structure. So don't, all, don't say, we did this, then we did that, and this and that, and have the same thing over and over and over. Another thing I want to warn you against is don't timeline. This is the biggest thing that we see and will be commenting on on your first drafts, is doing something that we call timelining. In your memo, or when you're writing a, a memo or a progress report, it's okay because you're talking about what you've done. But in a technical report, you don't want to say, first, we brainstormed ideas. Then we picked a, an idea to pursue. We know that. Just say, our brainstormed ideas are. The idea we are pursuing is this. So you don't need to create the timeline. It's just technical facts. Avoid the timeline. Other things you're editing for, you don't want to use passive voice. You want to use active voice. Define your technical terms, so if you're using some sort of acronym, make sure that some, everyone knows what that is in there. 
Um, then you want to add headings, make it look nice, lists, graphs, replace longer words with synonyms, don't use longer words just to try and sound smart. Then after that you do grammar and then after that mechanics. This is what it looks like. First you start with your style, it's the biggest, or your content, then you work on style, grammar, and mechanics. It's a, a upside down pyramid on how much time you should be spending on that revision stage. When you organize this, organize your paper, you write different parts for different readers. Like we talked about those different readers up front. Uh, the busy people are going to just quickly scan stuff. So they're going to read that executive summary. They're going to look at the headings and just read the sections that they really want to read. A lot of times they might just read your introduction and your conclusion. They don't want all this stuff in between. Um, then they'll be able, what they call here a focused search. That's where we see our subheadings, our lists, our white space that helps us to find what we need. In technical writing, you should use lots of graphs, lots of tables, lots of figures, because that's what really communicates with technical people. So less words, more pictures. Not that you can't have, not that you can only have pictures. Each picture, every figure needs to be explained in text. But the more you have, the better it is, because those people who are in a hurry are just going to look at those real quick and then try and read your interpretation of those graphs. Lists are also very good because it helps to draw our attention to things that are most likely important. And then any short follow-ups. You want to emphasize your beginnings and endings. Back, go, going back to thinking about how you create a paragraph, like you learned this in middle school, right? There's three to five sentences in a paragraph. The first sentence is the topic of the paragraph, then you have the body couple sentences, and the end is the conclusion sentence of the paragraph. People who are busy, like me, often will read the first sentence and the last sentence and not the stuff in between. Not just the intro and the conclusion of the whole paper, but just skipping those paragraphs too. And then you want to repeat your key points. If you have stuff that's important, make sure you repeat it. You don't want to use the same sentence over and over because they're going to bore us, but you do want to emphasize those key points. Readers read selectively never all at once. It's very likely that I'll get interrupted in the middle of reading your paper. So I need to be able to go in and either pick up where I left off or pick out the important information. All right, so here are our nine steps. As a reminder, write a brief purpose statement, consider the obstacles your readers will face, determine the technical levels of your readers, de determine the decision-making levels of your readers, Find out what decision makers want. Collect and document your information carefully. Write an outline. Write your first draft quickly and then revise in stages. Any questions so far? All right, now this is my favorite part. I am a formatting Nazi. I can sit for hours and just make things look nice in my writing. I love it and so I expect yours to also be pretty. Formatting is really important. Did, it, did she talk about formatting when you did the cover letters and resumes? When people are hiring, the first thing that they judge you on is how it looks. If it looks yucky, it goes to the side. They're not even going to read it. And I'm not kidding. This is real. This is true for your memos, this is true for your reports. The better it looks, the more likely, more attention you're gonna get. So overall, your page design should have white space. If it's just packed full of text, it's intimidating and we don't wanna read it. Isn't that true for you? Like if you just see a really long email that's all text, you're not gonna read that, right? Okay, one inch margins, keep it one inch. You don't wanna make it half inch, make it look better or any of that kind of stuff. You want to skip lines between paragraphs when you're using single spaced text um, and have unjustified right margins. So it's like fringy on the right, so it's not that full page thing. You know what I mean by that? So a lot of people ask when they start getting into their writing and doing reports for us, do you want double spaced, single spaced? I would go with single spaced. Uh, it just looks nicer. And I think of sing a double spaced as you'd use that for when uh, you're trying to get comments. 
and we're not going to print them and leave comments on them. We're going to leave comments within the on the Blackboard. So here's the actual rule. Does anyone remember this from intro? Because I remember talking about it. This uh, skip lines between paragraphs. You have two options. You can either skip a line. And not and uh, not indent. These go together, or you can indent and not skip a line. Got it. So if this first one here, your text on your paper will look like this. Do, 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 paragraph done, and then I skip down an extra return, and it looks like this. Whereas this sec second option is where I indent it here with a tab, I end, I don't double return, and then my next one is indented. Make sense? All right. You want to use substantive headings and subheadings. Your, he your outline could just become your headings and subheadings, but I highly recommend that they mean something. They don't just have to be introduction, conclusion, body, you know, that kind of stuff. Make it meaningful, like benchmarking of the blah product, something like that. So we can skim through and actually get something out of even your headings and subheadings. You really don't want to have a sub, one subheading under a main heading. I think you learned these types of rules when you learned outlining. Maintain parallel structure. So if you're using all present tense, use all present tense. If you're using all past tense, use all past tense. Whatever type of tense you're using and that kind of stuff. And similar, uh, similar wording so that it's parallel. You want to have at least one heading per page of text. So you don't want to have four pages of background because that's going to be too long. Lists are really good to use. So instead of having a long sentence that has like five or six things in it separated by commas, create a list. The rules with lists are if it doesn't have a sequence associated with it, it's just information, you can use bullets. For example, I'm using bullets here. If the sequence is important, like you're talking about steps, or the most important thing versus the least important thing, then you use numbers. Make sure you're using the correct grammar in your lists and a parallel structure. So either period at the end of every single one or not period at the end of every single one. Capitalize the first letter of each piece or don't capitalize. Make sure it's always the same that you do throughout the list. Use fonts effectively. Everyone remembers here that I'm a font Nazi, right? Font Nazi right here. So in the body of your text, you should use a serif font. As a reminder, a serif font whoop. This is a sans serif font. Serifs have these little things here that you probably don't even notice, but now that I point them out, you will. These are serifs, so they actually make it more ergonomic, easier for your eye to see bulk text. It, it gets your eyes less tired, so you want to use serif font for when you have lots of text together. So that should be the body. Uh, body text should be something like, I like to use Cambria, or Times New Roman. Um, not the default of Word. In the last iteration of Word, they made the default Calibri, which is a hideous sans serif text. So don't use that unless you're using it for headings. You can use uh, sans serif text like Calibri or Arial for your headings only use two types. So pick one serif, one sans serif, and that's what you're going to use throughout the entire time. That's fine too. Yep. Keep it simple. 
graphics. I said earlier you're going to want to use a lot of figures, right? So what are the rules I'm putting those figures in? They're a universal communicator. So my daughter, my 10-year-old daughter, can look at your, pay, your paper and better understand it when you have figures in there. You're going to do benchmarking. You're going to look up other products that are out there. Put those pictures in there because it makes it more interesting for the reader. Um, it creates interest. Refer to all of your graphics, though. You can't just plop them in. So if you have a graphic, it needs to have been talked about already in your text in the previous paragraph. So you should say something like the XYZ product as seen in figure one is the best benchmarking product that we could find or the you know something like that. I'm just making things up on the fly. But you need to refer to it by the figure number. Uh, by the number and title. Then make sure that you put it in the paper in a good place. Uh, you want it to try to be on that same page that you just referred to it. If it can't fit, then you can put it on the next page. Um, you can put bigger things in the appendix, but it's best to try and get everything within the body of the text. You want to position it vertically so it's, your paper stays in portrait as much as possible. If it's something really big or you have a really large uh, table or something like that, you can change it to landscape, but really prefer to keep everything in portrait. You don't want to have a lot of clutter. I know it looks cool sometimes to try and add columns and do different things with your figures, but really just put them in the middle and put the next one right below it in the middle. Keep it simple so it's not too cluttered. Also, something else I don't like about, well, the newer version is starting to get better, but if you create a graph in Excel, for example, you want to avoid the default horizontal lines and, and don't put any vertical ones in there either because it clutters it. If you're writing something really, really technical, you might need to add those so that people can see, but generally for reports and stuff, you want to take out those lines. And then your titles need to be descriptive. You have, say, figure one, colon, and then give it a title. Um, product XYZ and then write a brief sentence or two about it so it also has a caption okay and then if it's taken from something like XYZ products website reference it okay this is an example of a figure from my dissertation I didn't actually put the caption in here but you'll see it has the figure down here, so the, this is the title. Figure two, the reach to grasp task. And then I had a caption that describes what A, B, C, D, and E all are. Uh, you'll notice here that this is centered on the bottom of the figure. That's where it always should go for figures. Centered on the bottom. Then I have a table, which I also had a caption for. But it says table 3.1, ANOVA by object for joint kinematics of the model session. So it's descriptive, you know what it is. You'll notice here that the table uh, label is above the table. And it's left justified. So there's differences between tables and figures in how you label those. Types of writing. This is going to be giving, I'm going to give you some specific formatting rules for things like a memo, which you have due this week, and a report. But the first one we're going to start with is an email, because this is something you use to communicate every day. It is a technical communication piece, and I want you to remember this and consider it as you go forward and communicate with me, your professors, um, your managers, your boss, all that kind of stuff. The book that I used has this system that it calls ABC, so the abstract uh, body and conclusion. So the beginning, middle, and end of every single thing that we're going to talk about. In the beginning, you want to have a friendly greeting. Uh, it can be casual if it's a friend, but if you don't have that level, make sure that it's not casual. So this is something I always have a problem with, with the freshmen. It's getting better these days, but it used to be uh, per somebody would email me and just say, hey, Jody. I'm like, mm, nope, that's not going to cut it for me. 
I am Dr. Proceis. Or if you have another professor, you don't know if they have a PhD, at the very least, I should be Mrs. Proceis, you know, if you're not sure about that. So anyone who is in a, a higher, or like a teacher or your boss or something, always start off by calling them Mr. And Mrs. Doctor until they tell you otherwise. I remember my advisor in grad school, I called him Dr. Ebner for like a month and he finally just said, you gotta stop, just call me Tim. But I went in with the assumption to be polite, you know, you wanna make sure that you have that level. Make sure you have a short, clear statement of purpose. So the very first sentence should be, I'm writing this email to inform you about this. Then you can also uh, have a sentence that talks about the main topics to be covered. If it's gonna be a longer email, say I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna talk about this, then I'm gonna talk about this, then I'm gonna talk about this. Then in the middle, you put paragraphs that support what you said you were gonna talk about. Um, make sure that they're short. You don't, who, no one likes to read really long emails. Headings and lists, you should include those in emails. So make sure that if there's a heading, that way somebody who only needs one piece of information can just go look at that heading. Only use abbreviations and jargon when you know for sure that they're gonna understand that. And in the end, have a sentence that says what you talked about and what action you want from them, specifically. You might even, if they're a busy person, need to highlight that in yellow or underline it and bold it and say, please respond to this email by Friday. Something like that. So you're actually asking them and telling them what they need. If it's just informational, say, don't worry about it. I just wanted to have you, ha I just wanted to make sure you have this information. Here's an example of an email. You have a, you need a clear and concise subject line. Use format techniques that make it easy to read. So, Happy New Year, I hope you had a good break. I'm writing to announce some guidelines for approval, tr approved training for the next 12 months. So the first one is lab staff, then marketing staff, then administrative staff. So if this goes out to the entire company and I know I'm lab staff, I can just go look at this and not even have to read the rest of it. Makes it very easy for me. You wanna always have a positive and constructive tone. The biggest mistake that people make in emails is assuming that pe people can hear your voice. Things like sarcasm don't translate into emails. Big thing I want you to remember, emails can easily be forwarded to the entire world with the click of a button. And this happens all the time. And it's really, really embarrassing. There's also that stupid rep reply all thing so if it went out to the entire campus community and you hit reply all by accident and say something you regret, the entire campus community reads that. Happens all the time. An example, I don't know why this happened, but someone, um, a faculty many, many years ago, accidentally forwarded an email from a faculty in their department to all of the other faculty. And it was a long string of emails that they had gone back and forth about complaining about his teaching schedule. And in that, he said bad words and complained about having to teach three days a week instead of just two. And it just didn't go over well. So people do stuff like that. You have to be really, really careful. So always be constructive in your emails. All right, progress reports and memos. This memo is what you're gonna be using as your for formatting guidelines. Your uh, first report that's due this week, which, uh, where you have, what do they call it? What are we calling it? The, come on, I can't even remember now, but it's in your book, page 150. It's where you tell us about your group. So everybody has a role, you have, everybody understands their objectives of your group, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the beginning, you're going to have tell us the purpose of the report, uh, give us a brief overview of your project, a survey of the progress since the last report, so tell us what you've been working on. Then in the middle, tell us the tasks you've completed, uh, clear, clearly reference any problems you're having or dead ends that you've come up with, um, and then give it a brief description of what work you know remains in the project. At this point, that should be much larger than the beginning, right? So you're just getting started, but this is where you're gonna, going to include your Gantt chart. You should create a Gantt chart that goes into this memo, tells us what 
talk about your deadlines and kind of the idea of what you'll be going forward so everybody in your group knows what's going on and then in the end you say this is what we've done since the last time if you have any considerations please let us know kind of thing this is what it should look like like i said i'm a formatting nazi so you have a header this looks a lot like the email, but it's not automatically produced. This would be in Word. So you have a header with the date, who you're writing this to, who it's from, and a subject line. Then you have a heading, uh, introductory summary, where you tell us this stuff. Work completed, work planned, and your conclusion. So it should look nice. Then we have formal reports. Any questions about the memo? Yeah. That, uh, like outline, I guess, would that be on Blackboard? I'll put these slides on Blackboard, oh. the whole thing. Yep. You can also find templates and stuff online. Uh, Google Docs has them, Word has them to find templates that have headers and make things look nice. Formal reports. All formal reports should have a cover or a title page, either one, whatever you call it. It needs to have an executive summary, and we'll probably do an exercise on creating executive summaries later. But the executive summary needs to be able to stand alone. It's like an abstract. It actually has data in it. It has lots of information, so someone who's uh, busy can just read the executive summary and understand everything they need to know about your report. It's not a background. It's not a project description. It is actual meat and potatoes of your report. Then you need to have a table of contents. Anyone know how to generate that automatically? I love Word. I love being able to do that kind of stuff. It's so fun. So that stuff can be generated automatically. A list of figures can be gener generated automatically. A list of tables can be generated automatically. If you don't know how to do that, I'd love to show you sometime during my office hours because I get really dorky about it and it's fun. Then you have an introduction in your specific section. Each report that you do, we're probably going to tell you exactly what you need to have in there. So you should have gotten through this uh, much of the process already. That's each of the headings. So you should have done benchmarking, you should have done brainstorming, and those are gonna be your headings. Then you'll have a conclusion, recommendations, your references, and appendices if needed. How do you format these? Let's start with the title page. You need to have a project name. It's probably going to be larger text. You can even make it look nice and cool, like come up with a design and a logo for your team and include that on your title page. You don't want it to be too fancy, but something cool would be awesome. You want to tell us who this project or this report is prepared for, so that'll be the names of all of the professors, not just me, uh, who your group members are, then the date, a simple relevant graphic, like I said, a logo for your team. Keep it uh, relevant, but it's optional. And then on that front page too, that's where you, can, you should put your executive summary, right on that title page at the bottom. It should be one paragraph, uh, talks about your project, and it should be able to stand alone. I already talked about that. So we're go we are going to use the rubric that we have for this class. And you in groups are going to evaluate some writing that I have. So you're just going to take some time and look at this and try and, and evaluate some writing. And I made these laminated, so you can um, use markers and then I can reuse them in my next classes instead of having to wait for the paper.
you know, so that's, we would, there's not a definite, like, that you lose exactly this amount, but that's the range. Then is there an introduction? Does it have a project description without a solution in it, and it has a background? Yes, so you get 10 points. Or if it's kind of there, nine points, you know, that kind of thing. Then 80 points, 80 points for all of the meat of it, the body, the voice of the customer, all of these things. These are the details that we'll, you'll be going through to have included in your report. Then is there a discussion and conclusion? So there's 115 points for the content of the report. Then, uh, does it have references? That's 10 points. Make sure you have that. Presentation, that's the formatting, formatting Nazi. Is it organized? Does it have good style? So the total is 150 points. You all know how to read it? Good with it? Okay. Moving on, I want to talk about now oral presentations. Are you bored yet? <laughs> Who in here likes to give oral presentations? Yes, you're my kind of people. There's some sort of, I don't know the exact statistic, but there's some sort of statistic like 90% of the population would rather be in the casket, they'd rather be dead than giving the eulogy, right? You've heard this before. I don't know why that is. I, it's like my profession to have to get up and, stand and talk in front of people, but I understand that it does make some people nervous. So we're gonna talk about uh, oral presentations. First thing, preparation and delivery. Know your audience. Does that sound familiar? This is like, Everything we do, we need to know our audience. When we write, we need to know our audience. When we're giving a presentation, we need to know our audience. When you go through the engineering design process later, the very first thing you're gonna do is what? <coughs> know your audience, know your customer. It just all goes together, it's really fabulous. You wanna make sure that you're not gonna talk over anyone's head. So if you're talking to a group of middle schoolers, you might have to say things a little differently than a group of engineers, or maybe not, just depends. Um, have anyone ever heard the preacher's maxim? First you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. So that's the preacher's maxim. You have this, these three things. You give an outline, you tell us what you're going to do in the presentation. Then you do the presentation, it has all this stuff. And then in the end, you have a conclusion that you review what you talked about. Stick to a few main points. You don't want to overwhelm people, so you want to make sure that you're giving the information you need, but only with those main points. Like, stick to the main idea. You want to really only have an outline on your slides. You don't want to read your slides. You don't want to memorize either, because if you memorize, it sounds like you're reading quite often. Just know your stuff. It is the most likely that you are the expert in the room on whatever it is you're talking about. So just know your stuff. The biggest way to, or one way that you want to prepare and so that you don't do these things, you don't read, you don't memorize, and you just know your stuff, is to practice. Practice, practice, practice. And I mean do this out loud. Not just reading through what you think you're going to say or say it in your head. It makes a huge difference to actually do it out loud. Do it in front of a mirror. Do it with a tape, like record yourself. You can maybe do it for your roommates in front of a live audience so you can practice or videotape. Make sure you have enthusiasm. How many in here have, had, have ever been to a presentation where they're really, really bored? Like you are right now. Okay, no, but did that person have enthusiasm when they were talking or were they monotone and boring? That makes a huge difference. If you, you could be at a, a talk about something you're not even interested in, but if the person is expressing enthusiasm, you're likely to listen. Avoid filler words. Who in here knows the worst one? I know I've told you. I even do it sometimes. So, your generation starts every single slide with the word so. So, preparation and delivery. That is the worst way to go between slides. So this, so that. 
If you can replace the word so with the word therefore, then it's okay to use. If you can't, get rid of it. My generation, it was um. We said um all the time. People just said um between everything. Y'all probably do that a little bit too, but so is just so bad. Practice. That's the best way to get rid of those filler words. <coughs> For some reason, we as humans are afraid of silence and space. That's why we use filler words. Because we don't know, we're uncomfortable with just letting it be. So the more you practice, the more comfortable you should become with just having that space and not having that so and on filler word. Ask for help. Have someone watch you and listen to your presentation and tally how many times you say so and um, so that you can work on that and fix it. It's fun to sometimes use rhetorical questions as an introduction. They can be attention grabbers for your intro, they can be transitions between your main points. Instead of saying, so preparation and delivery, you might say, so how would you prepare and deliver a presentation? It gives you a way to transition without just saying the title or um, being more interesting. Make sure you give everyone in the room eye contact. In classes like this, I find that when you give presentations, if I'm sitting where Caitlin is, you look at me because I'm the professor. Make sure you're giving everyone in the room eye contact, okay? Because we all are interested. Everyone in the room is interested in what you're saying, whether you like it or not. 